Hello everyone and uh, a very warm welcome uh, to this session where we are talking about a subject that I think concerns everybody in terms of uh, equality and ensuring everyone has uh, access to uh, financial uh, services. So this session on uh, comparing notes on financial inclusion will draw from the experiences uh, from around the world. We are going to go to Asia, we're going to go to Africa, and we are going to go to Europe, but Europe meshed with emerging economies. I thank you all for coming and uh, joining us. Let me begin first with uh, the definition of financial inclusion as developed by the World Economic Forum. The forum defines uh, financial inclusion as access to and use of quality, affordable financial products and services that lead to greater financial well-being. One of my panelists wants to move beyond just enabling financial inclusion. We're going to be talking about financial health as well. So I'm really looking forward to this session. I did a bit of reading, and I thought what I'll do is begin, first of all, by perhaps uh, posing a, 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 a little quiz, which is the most financially uh, inclusive country in the world? Is there anyone who would have an idea which that country is? Singapore. Singapore. She comes, of course, from the region. Indeed, it is Singapore. When I went through that number, it was very interesting for me to also see African countries not doing too badly on that uh, measure. There were 42 countries that were measured last year. This report came out last year. And uh, I saw Ghana as well as uh, Nigeria ahead of Argentina in terms of financial inclusion. So work is being done to improve financial inclusion, but it's not enough. There is a lot more that needs to be done. I'd like to introduce my panelists for this session. Uh, please help me to welcome Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands. Uh, she is the United Nations Secretary General Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development. Your Majesty, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me also welcome uh, Sarai Chia. She's the governor of the National Bank of Cambodia. Ma'am, welcome. <laughs> With us also in this session is Munia Nakla. He is founder and chief executive officer of uh, MNT Halan Egypt. <laughs> and last but not least, let me welcome a fellow African, Ian Williamson, is Chief Executive Officer at Old Mutual. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Your Majesty, I'm going to start with you, and I really wanted your thoughts, just opening thoughts on financial inclusion, and perhaps you can include in it the work that you have done since you were appointed. Very good. So, well, I was appointed by the Secretary General in 2009, so this year, uh, I'm still a teenager of 15 years of <laughs> appointment. And um, in these last 15 years, we've actually seen, you know, the needle being moved in terms of financial inclusion. We're talking the first FinDEX, which is something I uh, helped uh, promote and, and, and happen. Um, we were something around 50% uh, globally. And now we, we know we actually are talking to the people doing the data. And this year, we're going to do a sort of another survey that's going to be presented next year. And we're going to be north of 80%. So this is a 50% increase. So sure. we're talking about sort of you know very um, successful, uh, I would say, project in trying to sort of you know get this uh, thing going. And how do we actually attain this? Well, first of all, there've been about 60 plus countries that have actually had financial inclusion national strategies. And um, this has been an effort of actually different ministries, not only the Minister of Finance with the central bank governor, but also the Minister of Social Affairs, because it's, you know, government to people payments that need to be done. The Ministry of Agriculture, because also agricultural policies that need to be considered. Um, there are issues like, you know, for example, uh, sometimes education, you know, there are sort of education stipends that are actually to be considered. So sure. the Minister of Interior, because you need to have an ID to open an account. So um, this, no notion of actually getting sort of uh, a coordination among ministries have actually really advanced the issues. So. Why? Because in order to open an account, you need to have an ID. Right. And um, I have to say that when, we, when I started this job, there were actually very little countries in Africa or Latin America that had one 
ubiquitous mm -hmm. type of ID, and certainly that <coughs> it was digital, and certainly that it was biometric. And uh, we really work with all our partners to actually help that being, uh, um, I mean, to grow this. And the interesting part of it is that, you know, yes, it is very necessary for financial services, but not only. Sure. You know, it's also good for school enrollment. It's also good for health who actually got a vaccination or not. Uh, it's, it's very good to actually f to get your subsidies, you know, from the government. So this has not only effect to the financial services. So it's a very important issue. So sure. The digitalization has played, of course, a very important role. And I think uh, we have here on my right a very good sort good of, example. Know, example of like, you know, how it actually you know, has been driven in Egypt. But it has basically brought the first two things, um, uh, increased affordability uh, by reducing the costs. Sure. And also the easiness, you know, now you have your bank branch basically in the palm of your hands. Sure. So this has actually really changed um, the access but also has changed the usage. You know, you, the, you know, you can actually sort of, you know, have access to a lot more types of products you could actually have done before. So sure. this notion now of going from, we're going access yeah. to usage. Yeah. We've been actually talking about the access side for some time. Then we actually went to usage and now we're going to the next frontier, which right. is the financial health. What are the outcomes? I would really, you know, once we put the rails there, we got to the people. Are we really get giving them the right products and services that are actually going to help people mm. have better uh, financial lives? And, and I love this issue of having definitions, so I'm going to give you the definition of financial health because I find it's a very important issue. Sure. It's one, is managing the concept of managing day-to-day -day finances. So poor people actually have very complicated financial lives sure. because they do not get sort of, you know, income once a month and, you know, the electricity bill once a month and this bill once a month. It's actually sort of, you know, quite chaotic. So they have to sort of, you know, surf around, you know, during the week to actually sort of get that money and getting themselves into very expensive uh, uh, sort of uh, credit tools to actually make uh, ends meet. Sure. Number two, invest in long-term uh, goals education of your children, adding another room to your house, yeah. um, maybe buy a tractor to improve your, your yields in, in, in the future agriculture. For that, you need better long-term credit mechanisms yeah. and savings. Number three is risks. Hmm. If we think we have risks, when you're poor in countries in Latin America and Africa, sure. you have much more risk. Absolutely. So we do so much work in trying to get people out of poverty. Yeah. And financial inclusion has actually helped people to get out of poverty. Yeah. But then something happens, yeah. and then we fall back into poverty again. So this issue of resilience is something extremely important. And that is, again, savings, having emergency savings, yeah. buffers, and insurance. And the, third, the fourth one is actually, are you confident enough in managing your financial life yeah. and are we giving them enough tools, budgeting, insights, yeah. um, you know, I think that, you know, in that sense, digitization will actually offer AI, will actually offer, you know, fantastic opportunity in actually giving people sort of, you know, the right advice to lower the costs, yeah. maybe increase their income and actually sort of match all the financial lives to actually sort of being able to save better. So I think this is a sort of sense Seen setter yeah. on what is financial, where is financial inclusion going? Absolutely. And um, what I think that you know our uh, focus should be actually lying on. Absolutely. I've got a personal question there for you. I mean, you speak with a lot of passion, and this question might bite me, but I'm thinking you are a queen, and you are immersing yourself in a subject that many would say is better left to bureaucrats. You, I would imagine, the things that you could do in your time, but you have decided to devote yourself to financial inclusion. I'm a bureaucrat. Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, people don't know what you do. Second, second I work for the government. <laughs> so, um, I think as a child, I was uh, born and raised in Argentina, and I saw what, you know, uh, inequality and lack of uh, opportunities and uh, high inflation uh, context would do to actually lower middle income people. And it's been always my passion sure. to try to sort of turn that around. Um, I was an economist and a banker, so this is what I can do.
Absolutely. So uh, if I would be a teacher, I yeah. probably would be in education. <laughs> so I, I decided that this, and I think that you know, financial inclusion is an amazing tool, an yeah. enabler. Yeah. You know, it touches upon seven of the 17 SDGs. Sure. So if we take this seriously, we can yeah. really build up so many things on yeah. top of it. Um, so this, I think it's a very nice crusade to be in. Absolutely. And we welcome your energy, no question about it. For those who are joining us online, please use the hashtag uh, WEF24. Governor, can I come to you? Um, perhaps your opening thoughts on financial inclusion, and of course, if you can uh, mesh that into the work that you are doing in Colombia. <laughs> so sorry, in Cambodia. Cambodia. Almost. Well, thank you. And, and I, I listened with a lot of interest what uh, Your Majesty was talking about the definitions of financial health. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to give a definition. I hope that it would englobe whatever you mentioned, financial inclusion and financial health. So my definition is financial inclusion is access to and usage of affordable, formal financial services in a timely manner, to your point, day to day, based on their needs with legal protection, something that you didn't mention about the legal protections. Um, so this is what definition we give to ourselves in Cambodia when we were preparing our national financial inclusion uh, strategies. To your point, uh, this is not something that central bank can do alone or any single uh, authority can do alone. We need coordination and this is why a national policy is very important. It's get everyone involved into this process. Yeah. And so in this national policy, there are six focuses, six priorities. Um, one is the um, encourage saving in formal financial institutions, uh, which sounds sort of uh, common sense, but not so common in yeah. many of our countries yeah. where you know, putting money under the mattress is more common than putting money in a, a financial institution. Yeah. Two is to promote innovative credit products for SMEs. So it has to, so, to be something that is um, suitable for, for them to use. Uh, enable the expansion of payment system capability because if you want to bring people to save in a formal financial system, that you have to have a mean that allow them to use that money because if you expect them to travel all the way to a bank branch and withdraw money, um, then it beat all the purpose and nobody is going to save in a financial institution. So you need a system that allow them to make payments straight from their bank account wherever they are, whenever it, um, it is. Um, the three is to, uh, four is to improve broader access to insurance, again to your point about financial health. Um, in Cambodia at the moment there's only 12% of the population having a health insurance versus to 70% having access to uh, financial, one form of uh, formal financial services. So this is something that we, we want to make sure and therefore build that resilience. Uh, five is to strengthen the capacity of financial sector regulators. It's also important because regulators need to strengthen themselves and make sure that these financial institutions are doing a good job, that they're stable. Um, and six is consumer, increased consumer empowerment protections um, and financial sector transparency. Uh, again, this is for the sake of financial stability because as regulator, Promoting access and usage is one thing. It's more sort of a developmental side of central banking, but we have to also look at the broader picture, which is monetary stability, financial stability, yeah. and therefore um, um, making the financial system more transparent uh, is something that is sure. at the core of our work. Yeah. So, so, so at 12%, you still have a lot of work to do. Do you find the political support that you require, or perhaps is that something that could be uh, perhaps increased and help you to do more? I think the, the, the national policy in itself is, is a strong political manifestation that they support this initiative because it's not just central bank. As I mentioned, everyone now will have a role to play in uh, uh, making this uh, strategy happen. Yeah. Um, but I think what is lacking is education and awareness. A lot of people uh, don't understand. People don't want to buy insurance because they don't see why they have to pay money up front. Yeah. Uh, what they don't understand is that when something happens, um, it's, it's going to be bad. And, 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 and we're talking here about people who are not educated at all, but 
I mean, as a bank regulator, I can make this uh, allusion to, you know, when, when we were facing the uh, global financial crisis and Basel III was introduced, and that means having the financial institution to increase their capital base, et cetera, nobody wanted to do because they think it's a waste of uh, resources. Sure. But in fact, this is a form of insurance. Yeah. So if these big financiers don't want to do that, yeah. how can you imagine and explain these pe poor people to, to go and pay upfront these insurance policies? Absolutely. I can tell you that uh, education, from a personal experience, is a vital, vital tool. I come from the rural areas. And I remember way back in the years when I started working, suddenly I had money in my pocket that I'd never seen in my life before. Yes. That experience was terrible. I saw that experience replicated. I come from Zimbabwe. I saw that experience replicated in South Africa upon the dawn of democracy. So let's go to South Africa. Ian, will you share your definition? I don't know if you're going to corroborate my story in terms of the importance of education, but the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to build on, on, on the governor's definition. It's more or less exactly the same as the one I would have used. I would have, rather than saying with legal protection, I would have just said a regulated product, but it's essentially yeah. the same thing. Um, you know, in a South African context, I think we've largely cracked the access problem. Uh, distribution networks are broad. Digital technology has allowed us to circumvent many of the historical access problems. We used to have a big problem where people from the rural areas, for example, would get to retirement, their pension fund money would become available, and then the, the, the problem of having to go every month to a payout point to pick up your monthly income was too costly. So we actually ended up circumventing that by having lump sum payments at retirement, which is also not a good answer. So I think there's that that world for me has has moved on. And I've started to think more about what I've called financial empowerment, which is a very similar Let thing to the financial health concept. And I, I think we're at the uh, at the, the frontier where it's actually mostly about the educational piece, to your point. Yeah. And that turns into a reduction in the information asymmetry between the provider and the consumer. And then that, that turns into appropriate usage of, of the products that are made available. Because what, what, what tends to happen if there's good access without appropriate informed demand, you've cracked the supply side of the problem, but the demand side of the problem is still deficient is that you get inappropriate credit extension. You get abusive interest rates being charged. You get payday lending happening. You get um, insurance being over-provided. And I think that that, that for me is, 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 is where the, the problem landscape is currently sitting. It's mostly around the, the usage, the appropriate usage, and therefore I think the, the root cause solution, the root cause solution to that is the is the educational piece. So what we do is we we conduct a what we call a savings and investment monitor once a year into the South African household population, which essentially monitors both the where the psychology of the of households is on an annual basis, how they're feeling about their finances. Do I feel like I'm in control? Do I feel uh, out of control? Do I feel that um, better than last year about, about where my family is at from a financial perspective? And we also then, as part of that survey, we monitor things like, well, what products are being used? How are they being used? Why are they being used? And one of the, the issues we have in South Africa is that there's a very high usage of informal savings products. Mm. So, you know, Godfrey will know about the concept of a stock file. It's basically a savings club, mm -hmm. and people informally get together. It's actually a great mechanism, but it's open to abuse uh, by the more informed members of the club versus the less informed members of the club. And so those kind of things create a, another problem. But I think uh, I'm very firmly on your page, and probably because we come from a similar background, <laughs> that you know, the financial education is yeah. key. Absolutely. And, and, and regulation example. becomes key, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do yeah, we see enough in terms of uh, regulation to protect those people who are so vulnerable? I mean, we're talking large population sizes here. We're talking millions of people. I think it, it obviously varies 
by country, but largely the, uh, I think financial service regulation is at least at a principal level was quite well harmonized. The details are horribly different and, <laughs> and, and you know, that causes yeah. all sorts of other problems. But at least at a principal level, I think it's quite well harmonized and there is quite a lot of protection. The problem, one of the problems we have in South Africa on that note is that awareness by consumers of the availability of things like an ombudsman there, it exists, the framework's there, the regulations are well intended. Yeah. People just don't know about it, so they yeah. don't take advantage of the, yeah. the mechanisms that are available to them to protect yeah. themselves. Yeah. And that, that's, that is a problem. And we know the capacity of the state in many of the countries where we come from is inadequate, and therefore the ability to be able to monitor and protect is limited. Let me come to you, Munia. You saw an opportunity in financial inclusion. You need to tell us, to your story. Sure. So. Uh... The story starts maybe 25 years ago. I was doing an undergrad dissertation on the impact of microfinance. Later on, I moved into a full-fledged study in, on the impact of microfinance. And I thought it's revolutionary. I thought it's really benefiting people's lives. And people really needed this finance into their businesses to grow their businesses, employ people, address new markets. Later on, in 2010, I got the opportunity to establish a vehicle financing uh, business. And it was a tuk-tuk business on credit. And they, these were revenue generating uh, businesses. And during the course of the following few years, we generated hundreds of thousands of jobs. Because the return on equity of a tuk-tuk is maybe 100%. You can collect your money in 10 months or in 12 months. But most of the owners didn't have the money uh, the startup capital to buy oh. the actual rickshaw. So we provided this, and it was a very creative way because there was no microfinance law that enabled private companies to do so. Later in 2014, I established a, a microfinance company when the law was issued. And we started focusing on women, and it was quite innovative. We, we focused on group loans for women, and probably we were the largest doing so. In 2017, we founded uh, Highland, MNT Highland, which is the company we have now. And it was basically to revolutionize access to financial services through technology. And together with my co-founder, Ahmad Mohsen, we started trying to create uh, uh, creative loans and creative financial solutions in general to this segment uh, to help them. To date, we've provided financing maybe north of $3 billion. We've provided uh, access to more than 3.5, 4 million uh, people in Egypt. And if you think of that the unique credit card holders in Egypt are 2.5, 3 million across all banks, wow. just gives you a bit of idea where we are. We, we ventured into payments. So we have a, a mobile wallet that has hundreds of millions of dollars throughput monthly. We, we, we launched our cards uh, very recently, and that will be a, a game game changer, the cards, because it will connect the customer to the application on a regular basis. And we will be able, we, we currently have a lot of algorithms analyzing a lot of traditional data and non-traditional uh, data like mobile usage, social media, what they're doing, in order to create personalized advice, whether it's in budgeting, whether it's in uh, uh, different products that if we see him buying a product that's going to have a discount in three weeks, yeah. we'd give him an advice. This is still not live, but this is work in progress and it's happening. Uh, I'd like to also uh, comment on a few things that were mentioned. Insurance. Insurance is something we've tried very, very hard with. And customers don't want to pay for insurance. And the only solution... Yeah, I wanted to. Uh, <laughs> they don't want to. They're telling you, you're giving me money from one hand and you want to take it from the other hand. What's this? Insurance. And what we eventually did is we embedded Bund the in bundling. Yeah. Yeah, this product includes insurance and, and it's for your, your own good. And even if very often we, we carry the cost and it's still uh, overall... Uh, Good, so uh, th this is what we're doing. We're very, very excited to be here. Yeah. And we're looking forward to take this business outside of Egypt into other regions. Sure. 
and we're looking forward to you doing so. And I think you are being modest. You're not mentioning that you are the fastest growing uh, provider of uh, uh, these products to the Egyptian population, Correct. and uh, you're also the largest. Uh, how has been your experience with regulators as you were expanding so rapidly? So regulators have been mostly supportive. Okay. Every uh, regulation that came up helped us enormously. We most recently are in the uh, sandbox of the Central Bank of Egypt for rotating uh, uh, sa savings and credit schemes. And this is, we're, we're going to do this digitally over a mobile phone. So 10 people, each one puts a thousand pounds. One person takes 10,000 pounds the first month, 10,000 pounds the last month. And it's a form of savings, it's a form of insurance, and it's a form of credit. But when it's not done in a formal manner, the, then it's not equitable, sure. it's not fair. Yeah. Because the last one is actually a saver and the first one is a borrower. And the only way they make it equitable is then they do another round and then the last one becomes the first and the first becomes the last. But obviously the market doesn't uh, always work in, uh, in so efficiently. But when we are organizing this, we ensure efficiency and equitability. Sure. Your Majesty, I want you to weigh in on some of the issues that you raised, especially around insurance. Yeah. But I also wanted you to talk to your pet because before we know it, time will have gone. We've got to talk about um, how you ensure financial health and whose responsibility that should be. I think it's a very good question and I, and I, I will like to, I wouldn't say disagree, but put the focus in a different way. I, uh, first of all, financial education, very important. I think that you know should be embedded in school curricula. Uh, children should know the basics of budgeting. They should know what is, you know, credit, more or less what is an insurance. But one thing, financial inclusion does not work. Education, sorry, does not work if you don't have the product you can actually sort of, you know, practice it immediately. So we've actually learned that in the Netherlands. We've actually done, I mean, very good sort of research on this. So Where do you begin, though? At what no, level? you have to begin my, you know, like I give my kids, you know, uh, pocket at money. At home. And, and, you know, when one day, you know, one of my children is like, you know, oh, well, you know, I hid my money here and I lost it. Well, now you will learn how to hit money <laughs> better. You know, if I go and save her, she's never going to learn. <laughs> so it, 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 I, I would like to say that financial education is definitely important, but it will not ensure your demand. Agreed. And it will, it will surely not change behavior. So if we look at insurance, and, and, and basically, um, today was actually having a conversation. Insurance is the most boring thing ever. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that I I'm an insurer, by the way. But I, but, I mean, yeah. it doesn't get anybody excited. It's the most unsexy thing in the planet. First of all, you never want to think about anything negative happening to you in the future. You want to think the rosy posy future you're going to have. Um, so, why should I, you know, maybe uh, start thinking and paying today <laughs> for something that might or not happen to me in the future? Death, oh my God, <laughs> God forbid. You know, so, you know, the only, even in developed economies, only the penetration of insurance is only 15%. Sure. And these are very sort of highly educated people, even in Singapore. So. We have to sort of realize that the notions uh, of how do we re get these, uh, our people resilience will yeah. not be by educating and telling the good things about insurance. It will never work. So it's about bundling. You take a credit, you also yeah. have an insurance that this person would actually you know, be able, if something happens, she will be able to, you know, you know, I had a visit in Morocco, by the way, and this lady had a bakery in her house and something happened with a gas leakage and her apartment went into flames. But she had a insurance and a credit. So she could rebuild her apartment in one month. She was back in the bakery again. So it was all embedded in a credit product. Or you could actually embed it in, you know, if you're selling a very good seed, which is actually drought resistant. Yeah. And that person I'm yielding much better sort of, you know, uh, yields uh, for the crops. That if something happens, yeah. you know, this person gets a 30%, you know, less half that he actually yeah. got, yeah. and therefore be able to buy that seed again. So the supply of the seed gets actually sort of, you know, his selling of a seed every year. So, um, so it's bundling, or you make it compulsory. Issues like pensions, the 401k is a compulsory thing. 
in the Netherlands, you know, apart from self-employed, is a compulsory thing. People do not think about the future sort of when they get a retirement. So, um, and uh, so we need to get a compulsory or we need to bundle it. So we need to start thinking on the financial health side, not so much on the demand, because, you know, I want to have a big TV flat screen tomorrow, you know. I don't want to be saying so. The issue is how do we define and design products? And the reality is there's been so little innovation in the last 10 to 15 years on savings, for example. So, Frankly. Uh, we just give sort of, you know, this is your savings account. It doesn't pay enough money. Um, they do not sort of, you know, very little sort of, you know, there's a couple of fintechs actually doing some very interesting things of actually, so for example, yeah. um, same for peculiar of commitment things or round up your, your purchases. There has been some kind of, uh, um, of, of innovation, but clearly yeah. has not been done in volume. And there's a huge amount of potential in looking into this whole saving things. Yeah. Also innovating in, in the whole insurance market. So I, I disagree that <laughs> financial education will actually create the demand. I think that the supply oh, side has a big responsibility. Yeah. And I think we have to do, make a lot better design. I think you did and I realize that you know, the <laughs> saving side is very much regulated. So there's yeah. little space sometimes to do that. Yeah. But that's why the public private uh, collaboration here is essential. Absolutely. The general no, well, yeah, fan their <laughs> books. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so so, so, so I, I, I think I should clarify what I meant. Um, we, we do. We do a few things in the financial education space. One is we do provide some school curriculum stuff, and I agree that's not very impactful because there's too much of a gap between the, the lesson learned and the practical application. But the biggest thing that, that we do practically on the ground is we do worksite education, and we actually provide the financial solution at the same time as providing the education. That does work. I think I can evidence with six million customers that it works, and I'm an insurer. And so, so is um, we, insurance you know, we are the biggest insurer in, in, in the country. I'm sorry for my. But question. I do think that I know that you agree with me. <laughs> it's a hard sell. So I'm giving you some counter. It is a hard sell. I'll give you. I'm just giving you a few counter examples. One of, one of the other things that we found to be quite effective, for example, in the savings space, we have a, a, a transactional bank account, or. It's a transactional account. I shouldn't call it a bank account because it's not a regulated bank. But that card has, uh, has a few features. One of them is that every time you spend money, you can designate a percentage of that money to go into your savings pocket. So it's the embedded concept for savings. And what we've done is because we, we provide mutual funds as one of the solutions that we offer, yeah. we put that savings pocket money into a mutual fund. So you're getting a, a money market, mm -hmm. institutional mm -hmm. money market rate of return on your savings and not a, a bank deposit rate of return on your savings. So that's quite a, a nice innovation that's very popular with our customers. Sure. Um, so I, I do agree totally that there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff around product innovation, which really turns into how do I give better value for money or a better return mm -hmm to someone who's looking to save. And you can only do that in two ways. One is you either giving away more of the, the investment return that's earned on the underlying assets, yeah. or you're cutting the costs. You can cut the costs by digital, solving your distribution problems, yeah. or et cetera. Yeah. Um, but I do, I do still fundamentally believe that even with a, um, a well-intended embedded solution, if consumers aren't informed about what they're actually buying, there's a real danger of them being the subject of serious abuse. Sure. And regulation need, doesn't necessarily solve that problem. I need Munir to come in very quickly because the governor needs to weigh in as well on the issue of insurance. And we need to talk about the role of technology. Everywhere around us, we are abuzz uh, with the issue of AI and the role that it could potentially do in our economy. So Munir, quickly, sure. and then so we come to the, the governor. Very quickly on savings. We live in a lot of countries where have that there's very, very fast inflation. So double-digit inflation, Egypt last year was north of 30% inflation. So a lot of these people who are saving in traditional manners, they find that their savings are being depleted. So we, create, we, we, we came up with a, a creative solution uh, a few months ago, which is 
to uh, save slash invest in gold. And this can be uh, digital and it's uh, inflation protected because it's US dollar denominated, obviously. And we, we're seeing huge pickup. Uh, couple this with technology, then the distribution becomes exponential sure. because you can distribute it exponentially through an application. Thank you. Thank you, Monia. Government? Um, I don't know whether it's polite to disagree with the Queen. But <laughs> <laughs> you can do I'm so polite. I'm going to say financial education, financial literacy is not the only way to promote access, but it is essential. And I think context matter. And the reason I say that is because in Cambodia, for instance, building the trust and confidence is very important. This is a country where we've gone through 30 years of civil war. This is the only country in modern history where monetary system or money was completely abolished in the country from 1975 to 1979. And the entire country was reduced to a barter system. Nowhere else you see that not even in North Korea. And so overnight, people were losing their saving right, in the bank accounts. Now, how to bring back this confidence and trust to a very traumatized people? How to encourage them to go and save money in financial institutions? Now, the next generation will also hear from their parents about, remember, you know, I lose my money in, in, in the bank overnight. I don't want you to save in the financial system or a bank. Yeah. Why don't you buy gold to save? Why don't you buy land? Why don't you do something else? So this is something that is very important to educate from a very young uh, about the importance of saving, the importance of credit, the importance of certain things that is uh, important for them. Sure. The, the other things also important, I believe, is particularly girls, because girls are the most likely to drop out of school. And without some basic understanding about financial matters, um, I think once they leave school, they'll be done. They'll be sure. doomed. And it will be very difficult for them to be alive and will be solely relying on the husband, that's not something that we want to happen. Absolutely. So I think this is uh, a very important. And also to your questions about uh, technology, there, there's something that I've worked on yes. um, that uh, is very important, I think, to promote uh, access. One is the credit bureau, and we've never talked enough about credit bureau. We've established credit bureau um, about 20, about 10 years ago, and we actually learned uh, the model from Egypt. I went to Egypt to, to look at how it was built. And I think it's important to have a professionally run credit bureau that include both negative and positive information. Um, not just negative, because then it feels like it's a punishment, but we also include the positive then become an incentive, because if you repay on time, uh, then this is an incentive for banks to look at you in a different angle and maybe give you a cheaper loan. The credit bureau is very important to help access, but also important for central banks or for regulators to uh, better manage the whole entire system in a very transparent manner. Um, the other thing also about this credit bureau, it has to be comprehensive. So microfinance and bank needs to be in the same uh, system because then you would al easily allow this person to graduate from microfinance to bank easily. Because if you have two different credit bureau, which happen in a lot of country, once you exit the, the microfinance, you go to the bank, then you have to rebuild the entire history about yourself again in the bank bureau. Mm -hmm. So to have this comprehensive credit bureau uh, is very important. And the second thing I think it's important uh, is the digital infrastructure. Yeah. I, I mentioned earlier about how, how, would you, how can you encourage people to go and save if for them then to need the money, they have to ride a motorcycle, to withdraw money from the ATM or bank branch. You have to make it easy and accessible. Yeah. And to provide an infrastructure of interoperability among the different players in the country is very important. Yeah. And we've done that with our uh, um, Bakong system, which is a blockchain-based technology, where we bring everyone, all the bank, all the customers of the banks in the country to talk to each other. They can send money across from different banks, uh, but not only um, in the country, but also across the border. So sure. people with bank account in Cambodia can go to our neighboring countries or partnering countries yeah. to make payment there. And that's encouraged them to save because then they will, if they open an account, they can go and they can transact easier. Okay. To have a credit card is very difficult in our country because you have to provide a lot of things. In fact, 
basically, Master yeah. Visa card in Cambodia worked as a, more like a debit card. You have to deposit money for the bank to issue. Yeah. So having a bank account and to be able to just go across the border and make payment yeah. is helpful. The other thing is also for tourists to come into our country, the partnering countries that um, come to Cambodia, they can also make payment from their bank account. That implies that the, the, the seller, the small shop owners, yeah. have to open a bank account so. and put up their QR code in order to get more customers, particularly tourists, oh, to wow. come and buy. So. And that's, again, forced them to go and open a bank account. Wow, sure, sure. So sure, sure. to your point about uh, the cultural considerations, um, experience also matters, of course. I give the example here of uh, Zimbabwe. When a hyperinflation hit the country, nobody wanted their money in a bank account because they found, even those who were holding US dollar found overnight, your money had become Zim dollars, Zim dollars which had become worthless. So very important to consider that. We need to ask you the question around technology and whether it could be perhaps the uh, panacea to all of this. We've got four minutes and I just wanted to get a couple of points from around the room. Very quickly, if you can. Yes, I think technology is changing the world in general and it will be able to provide very, very targeted, personalized financial advice to individuals to manage their financial life. Moreover, when a creative product is designed, it's very easy to disseminate and the onboarding becomes easier. I think one critical thing for that yeah. is to, for, to have digital KYC, which is, does not exist in all countries, but it is a game changer. And e-signatures that are accepted by courts because uh, an e-signature -sig where the, a court doesn't operate on, it's uh, practical uses. Moreover, uh, uh, I think we, we, it, the development and design teams, yeah. uh, the technology development and design teams, the productivity are, is growing 5x, 10x because of large language models. Sure. So, and very soon we'll be able to provide 24 7 customer support service without humans. Just Using technology. Uh, I would like to say something, and I think that a lot of people have been a little bit mentioning it, but um, apart from the full financial education, I think that. Uh, don't get me wrong, I mean, I, I, I'm the president of the financial education system in the Netherlands, so <laughs> I am competing for it, but it will not assure you demand. And, and I think it's more sort of, you know, you see that if you design the products properly, then you see it. And it would not assure your financial health either. So I think that's a distinction I would like to make. Um, we've been working in the last 10 years on a notion that we call digital public infrastructure. Sure. And, um, but, you know, on our experiences of different countries to actually have this sort of stack of things that are actually very important. One of the things, the IDs, e-signature, digital ID. Um, so that's extremely important. Even having a QR code <laughs> legislation is very important. Um, having credit bureaus is also something very important. Credit bureaus that probably will be... I would say not replaced, but in some way uh, enhanced by open finance regulations that are actually now we're having very good examples in Brazil, mm. India, Singapore. Um, I know, well, you have open banking in, 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 in the European Union, but that's something that is actually will be turning basically the empowerment of the data yeah. from the financial service provider to the consumer, and that's, I think, has holds great promise. So. Everything that has to do with consumer protection laws, uh, recourse mechanisms, because also that has to be also some kind of protection. Mm -hmm. Interoperable payment systems. That would actually completely uh, uh, be a game changer in terms yeah. of you know, having more competition yeah. in the whole system. Um, connectivity. And something nothing, nobody has actually mentioned, cybersecurity and fraud prevention, because the more digitization we have, we have also other risks coming in. Yeah. And that's, you know, the fraud and cybersecurity issues are actually very, very important. Your Majesty, I wish I had your powers because then I would just declare that this session is going to continue for another 20 minutes. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> the World Economic Forum won't allow me to. But is there anyone with a burning point that they would like to make? There's a lady there and there's a lady there. So you are looking at the same clock that I'm looking at. My name's Roshani and I run uh, one of the largest microfinance programs in Pakistan for women. Thank you. Um, you know, it sounds very sexy 
policy to talk about digital uh, you know, uh, infrastructure and financial inclusion and how they will all pair up together. But actually, FINDEX is showing that gender divide is increasing as far as access to finance, finance is concerned. So my question to the Queen is, and we worked together earlier as well, uh, what are the three things we need to do? What have we not done enough of to actually push the needle for women? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Let's quickly take the point from the lady here in front. I'm Amal, I'm from Egypt, and I've witnessed and been a beneficiary of uh, MNT Highland success. Oh, wow. uh, so okay. I'm uh, personally very proud of the financial inclusion we've witnessed in Egypt so far, and I hope to see it scale to the rest of the region, if not the whole global south. But I wanted to ask about AI and how you see that increasing, you know, the ability to bundle more products, to get more creative, and to the governor's point on credit and how to have all the data in one place to create, create more products. And hopefully, I think Egypt uh, with MNT Highland and, you know, like that will be more financially inclusive than Singapore one day. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Your Majesty, you want to answer? Roshane, nice to see you. I, I knew that you were running around here. Um, actually, uh, the FinTech numbers are, were pretty okay on the gender gap. So we went from 9% to 6% and uh, globally 4%. So we've been doing a lot of work and what it, it, the, the work that she's doing is extraordinary, by the way. So uh, uh, talking about sort of, you know, education, tuning that with, you know, financial services and not only financial services, also tuning up with a lot of other extension services. Yeah. Um, specifically for women, but issues like uh, in certain certain countries, I know that in Pakistan we have not moved the needle on, on the financial access for women. Um, Nigeria, 20% gender gap, and we, I just spoke to the vice president about this issue. Mm. Uh, but in some of the countries we've done actually very good work, and one of the things we've actually seen that really helps is, first of all, connectivity of women. Women have less smartphones than men, use much less of uh, have much less access to internet connectivity than men. Sure. So this issue of getting women connected is very important. Then we rely on agents for the mobile money, and a lot of these agents are men. So women do not want to go to their neighborhoods to the men and go and deposit <laughs> because then the husband wouldn't actually know <laughs> that she has so much money. No, but you, we're all laughing. But you know, privacy for for women is extremely important, so. privacy and security. So, sorry, I, I mean, I, it, it, it is a very important factor. And yeah. having women agents has been a game changer in a lot of economies. Yeah. And then the adequacy of the products, looking at the female needs, which actually are different yeah. than some of the men need. So um, these three things have been a game changer. So I, I hope that we continue to do that work and yeah. uh, I continue sort of, you know, the supporting. Uh, and I hope that, you know, this, this drop of payment system, the rest uh, in, 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 in Pakistan will actually sort of, you know, help spur that innovation and, and competition in your country and, and, and they can actually sort of get more women inserted. Yeah, Majesty, thank you very much, and I'd like to thank everyone who has been in this room and those who have been listening online. The conversation must continue, and uh, there's certainly no end to this one. I took our way out of this session. Policies need to change, and we need to recognize the gender gap. We have to strengthen regulation. Education is absolutely key. Ian, your business appears to be safe. Thank you for listening. Please help me to thank Her Majesty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your participation.